Ever scroll through Twitter and wonder, how they decide this is what I need to see? It's like someone or something is playing puppet master with our timelines, right? Right, like what's the secret sauce, you know? Well, get this, Twitter actually kind of, sort of gave us the recipe. They released the source code for their recommendation algorithm. Whoa, for real. They just put it out there for the whole world to see. On GitHub. We're talking the code that chooses what shows up on millions of people's timelines every single day. Okay, that's huge, but also code is like a foreign language to me. What is a recommendation algorithm in plain English? Simplest way to put it, it's a set of instructions, a behind the scenes process that personalizes your online experience. So with Twitter, it's deciding which tweets actually make it onto your feed and even the order they show up in. So it's not as simple as just showing me tweets from people I follow in chronological order. No, not even close. And get this, th the source code, it reveals the same algorithm. It's not just for your main feed either. Search, explore, even notifications, it's way more widespread than people realize. That's actually something that jumped out at me when I was looking through the documentation. They really wanted us to zero in on two main areas. Yeah. That free you timeline and recommended notifications. But let's start with the one we're probably all most familiar with, that for you timeline. Makes sense. It's where most of us spend the majority of our time on Twitter. So there's this super helpful diagram in the source code that lays out the whole process. Looks like we'd break it down into three main stages. First, they got to find potential tweets. Then there's a whole ranking system to figure out what's most relevant. And finally, a bunch of mixing and filtering happens before those 280 characters hit our eyeballs. A whole lot of work goes on behind the scenes for sure. So much. Okay. Let's start at the beginning. Stage one, candidate source. Where do these potential tweets even come from? Three main places, according to the code. There's something called the search index, then there's the car mixer, and then there's, get this, the user tweet entity graph, or as the cool kids call it, the UTEG. UTEG sounds like something out of a sci-fi movie. Right. It's pretty wild. Imagine like this massive web connecting every single user and every single tweet, kind of like a map, a constantly updating map of the entire Twitterverse, nah. the UTEG. It's tracking everything you do, who you follow, who follows you back, what you like. It uses all that to figure out what you're into, like what your little corner of Twitter is all about. But get this, the really interesting part is that like half of the tweets that end up on your feed, they actually come from the search index. Wait, seriously? So you're telling me if I'm searching for like new headphones on Twitter, that could actually influence what I see on my main feed later, even if I'm not searching for anything at that moment. You got it. They call it in-network sourcing. Basically, your past searches, they have a way of influencing what you see in the present. You know what? That makes sense. Now that I think about it, if I search for something specific, I do start seeing more tweets about that topic, uh -huh. even if I'm not following those accounts. Exactly. And that Chrome mixer you mentioned earlier, that's where the out-of-network tweets come in. Those are recommendations that are a bit more out there, stuff you might not even know you're interested in yet. So Twitter's like a matchmaking service for our interests. Love mm -hmm. that. Okay, so we've got this massive pool of tweets. Now it's time for stage two. Ranking. <laughs> How does the algorithm decide what's going to make the cut? All right, so this is where it gets really wild. The code and mentions two big players, the light ranker and the heavy ranker. Think of them like filters, but like super powered filters. A dynamic duo of Twitter sorting. What makes the heavy ranker so heavy? It all comes down to these things called neural networks. Have you heard of those? Oh, yeah. Neural networks, aren't those like the rock stars of the AI world? You know it. They're these crazy complex systems, right? But they're inspired by the human brain. And these neural networks, they're able to take in tons of data and actually learn from it, make predictions based on it. So in the case of Twitter, the heavy ranker, it's looking at tons of signals, just trying to figure out, okay, which tweets are most likely to grab this person's attention. And the light ranker, that's like the warm up act. Think of it more like it narrows things down for the main event. The light ranker picks out the most promising tweets, especially from that massive search index we talked about. It basically makes the heavy ranker's job a bit easier, more efficient. Smart. So, okay, tweets are ranked by these algorithms, but there's still one more stage, tweet mixing and filtering. This is the final hurdle they got to clear before they land on our timelines. And you are not going to believe who shows up for this part. <laughs> Just right. kidding. This stage has a few more players we got to meet. The home mixer, the visibility filters, and the timeline ranker. Okay, break it down for us. What's the home mixer all about? 
Okay, so imagine the home mixer is like the conductor of an orchestra. It takes all those finely ranked tweets and decides exactly how they're going to appear on your feed. It's not as simple as just showing you the top ranked tweets first, though. Oh, really? What else is there? Well, the home mixer, it's thinking about a lot of things to make sure your feed is diverse, engaging, all of that. Like, mm -hmm. it might sprinkle in some tweets from people you're close with, accounts you interact with a lot, even if those tweets aren't, like, the absolute top ranked ones. Ah, uh, so it's all about striking a balance. Like, yeah. we want to see what we came for, but keep it fresh too, right? You got it. Predictability, but also that element of surprise. I'm picking up what you're putting down. What about those visibility filters though? What's their deal? All right, so this is where things get a little more complicated, a little more serious. These visibility filters, they're on the lookout for anything that goes against Twitter's rules, content that could be harmful. So we're talking spam, abuse, misinformation, all that bad stuff gets weeded out by the visibility filter. That's the goal, yeah. Yeah. But it's definitely a tough job. And the code, it even mentions these trust and safety models. I would bet those are involved in flagging potentially problematic stuff. Now, that is a whole other deep dive waiting to happen. Tell me about it. Okay, last but not least, there's the timeline ranker. What's its role in all of this? All right, so the timeline ranker, if we're sticking with our orchestra analogy, this is like the veteran player, super experienced. It's primarily focused on providing those relevant scores for tweets that are coming from the early bird search index, you know, the one we were just talking about. And it also handles stuff from that UTEG service. Interesting. So even though it's, what did you call it, a veteran system, it's still got an important part to play. Oh, absolutely. And I think that just goes to show these systems are constantly evolving. The source code, it's like a snapshot, a moment in time. I guarantee you behind the scenes, Twitter is always tweaking, refining, updating these algorithms. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense, right? Technology changes so fast these days, they've got to be agile. Exactly. It's a fascinating challenge to say the least. Yep. Okay, so we've got the basics down, right? Like how Twitter finds tweets, ranks them, filters them. But there's some really interesting stuff buried in this source code, stuff that makes you go, hmm, didn't think about it like that before. Right, like that whole tweet cred thing we touched on earlier. Yes, the tweet cred algorithm, the one based on PageRank. Break that down for me, because honestly, PageRank sounds more like a website thing. So remember how Google decides which websites are like the most legit, most important? They use this thing called PageRank. Think of it like it's measuring a website's popularity contest. Okay, I'm with you. So Twitter's tweet cred, it's kind of the same idea, but instead of websites, it's ranking users. And the more tweet cred you have, the more Twitter's like, yeah, we trust this person, let's get their tweets seen. You got it. And it's looking at all sorts of things, how many followers you've got, how often your tweets get retweeted and liked, even who follows you. It's all about understanding like your impact, your influence in the Twitterverse. So basically, if someone with a massive following tweets something, it's more likely to be seen than like me tweeting into the void with my 20 followers. Pretty much, yeah. But here's the interesting thing, right? Twitter has to walk this tightrope between like amplifying those already well-known voices, but also making sure that people who are maybe less known, they don't get totally drowned out. It's that whole echo chamber thing, right? Yeah. We want to hear from experts, from influencers, but we also don't want to get stuck just seeing the same opinions over and over again. 100%. And speaking of things that might be hidden, did you catch those trust and safety models mentioned in the code? Ooh, yeah, that caught my eye. Anything interesting in there? Well, they don't exactly give us all the details about how those models work, and for good reason. If they just told everyone exactly what they're looking for, can you imagine? It wouldn't be long before people were figuring out ways to game the system, you know, sneak in all that harmful content. Right. Can't give away all the secrets. Exactly. <laughs> but even without knowing exactly what's going on under the hood, it's clear they're putting in work to try and identify all the, like, the spam, the harassment, the misinformation, you know, all the stuff that makes being online kind of a bummer sometimes. Right. It's easy to forget. But even though we're talking about algorithms and lines of code and all that, there are still humans involved making judgment calls about what we see and don't see. Big time. And those decisions, they have real consequences. No doubt. You know, it's funny. We started this deep dive hoping to really crack the code of Twitter's algorithm. But mm -hmm. I feel like I have even more questions now. That's the mark of a good exploration though, right? And honestly, I think that's kind of what Twitter wanted when they decided to make all of this source code public, get people thinking, get people talking. Well, they definitely did that. So for the average person, you know, just scrolling through their feed, what does all of this actually mean? What's the takeaway here? 
That is the million dollar question, isn't it? I think for me, it all comes down to awareness. Awareness of what specifically? Awareness that what we're seeing online, you know, who we interact with, even what we think about certain things, it's being influenced, sometimes even controlled by these systems. Mm. And we don't always realize just how much power they have. So it's not just that we're seeing information, but we're seeing a very particular version of information, one that's been curated, tailored to what these algorithms think we want. Bingo. And while that's definitely got its upsides, right? Discovering new stuff, finding people who are into the same things as you. Right, right. But there's got to be a downside. It can't all be sunshine and roses, right? Yeah. What's the catch? Well, it's like this, right? The algorithm, its whole goal is to keep you glued to your screen, right? Yeah. Keep you engaged. And one of the easiest ways to do that is to show you stuff you already agree with. Oh, so it's like that saying, you are what you eat, but for our brains. Exactly. It's way too easy to get stuck in that echo chamber where you're only seeing one side of every story. Ugh. Yeah. I've definitely had those moments where I'm like, Wait a minute, am I only seeing what this algorithm wants me to see? It's kind of creepy when you think about it. It really is. And it's not just about like limiting your worldview either. This whole thing, it raises some red flags about manipulation too. Think about it. If an algorithm knows exactly what makes you tick, what you're going to click on, what you're going to share, well, that information, it's super valuable. Because then it can be used to like subtly influence what we think, what we do. Unfortunately. Okay. Not going to lie, this is kind of freaking me out a little bit. I get it. But look, the good news is, now that we're a little more aware of how this whole thing works, we can be smarter about how we use Twitter. So knowledge is power, as they say. But what can we actually do differently? Give me the tools to fight back. First things first, don't just blindly trust everything you see in your feed. Just because a tweet shows up on your timeline doesn't mean it's the gospel truth. Do your own research. Don't let the algorithm do the thinking for you. Exactly. And I know this might sound a little counterintuitive, but like actively seek out different viewpoints. Follow some accounts that you don't agree with 100% on everything. You never know. You might actually learn something. Break free from the echo chamber. I love it. Right. And finally, just talk about it. The more we're having these conversations about how these algorithms, how they're affecting us, the better equipped we'll be to, you know, to deal with it, to ask for more transparency from these companies. That's a really good point. This isn't just about Twitter. It's way bigger than that. Algorithms are everywhere. And we need to be talking about how they're shaping our world at every level. Absolutely. And honestly, I think Twitter making that source code public, that was a step in the right direction. Hopefully it's the start of a bigger trend towards more transparency from tech companies in general. Agreed. Well, this has been a lot to process. But you know what they say? A little knowledge goes a long way. So to wrap things up, I got to say, even with all this new information, all this access to the source code, there's still something kind of mysterious about it all. You yeah, know? you don't know everything. It's like, we can kind of see how the sausage is made, but the exact recipe, the proportions, how much of each thing they're putting in there and how it's all constantly changing, well, that's still a secret. That's a really good way to put it. And it's a good reminder, right? Even with these glimpses behind the curtain, these algorithms, they're constantly learning and growing and changing how they influence us, sometimes in ways we may never fully understand. I think the best thing we can all do is stay curious, stay critical, and never stop asking questions. Couldn't have said it better myself. As always, thanks for taking this deep dive with us. We'll see you next time for another behind-the-scenes look at the tech shaping our world.